Are we still being ripped off with global roaming fees? And will the mobile ad blocking wars escalate? Welcome to Vertical Hold, the tech show where we channel surf through the headlines in search of the big picture. I'm Adam Turner and I'm here with a man who has the death sentence on 12 systems, Alex Kidman. Alex, what's new in tech? BlackBerry's return to the local market, with Optus picking up the Canadian manufacturer's first fully Android-based handset, the Priv. They're not selling it outright, but if you're keen, plans will start at 67 bucks a month on a two-year contract. The MBN is getting a boost in the outback as it prepares to put the first of two SkyMuster communication satellites into service. It's running a 200 home Victorian trial in February and aims to make the service available across the country in April, offering download speeds of 25 megabits per second to Australians who live well off the beaten track. Apple's issued a recall on circular duckhead plugs supplied with its Mac, iPhone, iPod and iPad products in Australia. They're offering replacement square duckhead plugs for affected plug types due to the risk of electric shock. The affected plugs bear a four or five digit code or no code at all. But if your duckhead plug reads AUS, AUS, you're already safe. The recall affects adapters sold on devices between 2003 and 2015, which potentially means millions of iffy plugs could have been in Australian homes for quite some time. Watch what you say online, as Centrelink is hiring private investigators to snoop on our social media habits in an effort to catch Australian welfare cheats. In one case, a couple who had been fraudulently claiming two single payments were caught red-handed on Twitter after they announced that they were a couple and expecting a baby. So Adam, Sky Muster sounds to me like a superhero with a speech defect, but it's not. <laughs> is it, however, super news for the bush? It is for the bush. I think Sky Must is one of the, the, the good news stories out of the NBN, even though uh, when Turnbull was in opposition, he said this was the satellite that we didn't need, but um, it's actually going to make a big difference. He said a lot of things. When he he was did in opposition. say a lot of things. Uh, basically, they put one Sky Master satellite up in October, and it's just about to go into service, and there's a second one coming uh, later this year. And between the two of them, they'll stretch right across the country and anyone who's not within the range of the fixed line and not within range of fixed wireless will be put on the SkyMaster. Now they can get 25 megabits per second down and 5 megabits up, which might not sound like a lot to people on fiber, but hey, I live, I can see the CBD from my house and I would kill for speeds like that. Yeah, I mean, I guess the other thing to point out is these satellite plans, which, and these have been part of the NBN plan for absolutely ages because you can't yeah. put up a satellite in a casual manner but these satellite plans are for the people who genuinely are absolutely remote yeah these people right? this were is never a very very small fiber. fraction of the population um including some i suspect where even things like telephone service have been an interesting innovation yeah. in recent years so yeah i mean there's 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 a lot of plus here but it's always stuff that was kind of built into the system yeah, these people didn't get screwed by the switch to the new look MBM because under any plan, they were part of that 7% that was never going to be part of the fiber footprint. So I think on the moment they're on the interim satellite service, they've had to cut back download limits on that. I think you're lucky to squeeze 5 megabits per second out of that. So uh, SkyMust is going to look pretty damn good to them, I think. Yeah, I mean, as with everything, people will fill the capacity as they've done with the interim satellites. And this is one of those bits of technology that will need replacing probably in 10 to 20 years, I would suspect, because we're the, the need for broadband is going to accelerate at that level. But you're still only going to be talking, I suspect, that smaller scale of actual users just because of the way we live in Australia and the concentration of population that we've got. Yeah, well, the MBN said to me that they expect a, about a 16-year lifespan for the satellite. So, yeah, it's not unreasonable at that time to say, hey, let's put something up there with a bit more capacity. But for now, I think it's, it's a pretty good first step and at least brings those people into the ballpark and will give them access not just to individual services they haven't had access to before but they'll be able to use their internet access for more than one thing at a time and i think that's what the nbn is all about not just hey i can watch netflix but i can w watch netflix while my kids making a skype call while someone else is doing something else the uh, sky is also going to be part of the satellite of uh, satellite of, sorry school of the air 
if you're with School of the Air, there will be dedicated bandwidth for you on SkyMaster. You'll actually have a separate one of the Ethernet ports on your home mode and will be the School of the Air port. So even if your little sister chews up all her all the household bandwidth watching Netflix, the School of the Air will always work. All right, so Alex, I think a lot of us have felt the sting of global roaming. The prices have dropped from horrendous to just terrible in the last couple of years. But it sounds like there is some good news on the global roaming front. Well, there is depending on who you're with and who you're travelling with uh, in terms of carrier. Uh, the big news of this week was Vodafone's push to both sign up Qantas for frequent flyer points, if you like that kind of thing, but also announcing that at least for a year from now, if you travel to New Zealand and you're on a Vodafone contract mobile, whereas they normally charge you five bucks a day to roam, which, whilst that sounds like a lot, is actually moderately reasonable against what you can. Telstra. Yeah. Compared, compared to what you pay for a lot of the other carriers, especially if you don't prepay, it's it's pretty reasonable. For New Zealand, no charge whatsoever. You just use your phone as it would be with whatever inclusions it's got, which is a really nice deal in some ways. Now, it's worth pointing out that whilst Vodafone's a global brand, all of its businesses are separate business units, and it's, it's incredibly complicated. Here in Australia, for example, Vodafone is a merger between Vodafone and Hutchison, who yeah. used to run the old three brand here. Three still exists in other parts of the planet, but it's got nothing to do with Vodafone there. Here it does, and they did run as sub-brands for a while. Now they don't, they're just Vodafone. But the sh long and short of it is, Australians with a Vodafone Australia contract can roam for free in New Zealand. But if you're a New Zealand Vodafone customer, you can't roam for free in Australia. Yeah, but it's definitely um, a so step in the right direction, though. It's nice to see these kind of deals are happening and they're moving in that kind of direction rather than just trying to screw us for as much as they can get. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, I think the other um, the other thing there is there's more pressure from most telcos. I mean, you mentioned Telstra and you mentioned Optus, and yes, Vodafone is cheaper than they are on that kind of thing. But um, the reality is that all of their prices have actually dropped quite a bit if you're prepared. And there's a lot of pressure for this to happen on a global level, um, especially in the EU. There are EU directives that are calling for an end to roaming charges for any EU partner country. So, you know, if you had a UK, if you had a UK plan, you should be able to go to France and pay no more than you did for your existing plan, that kind of thing. Now, that obviously creates a nice little block if you happen to be European. We're on the other side of the planet, but hey, they let us into Eurovision. Anything's possible. Um, and I think as that starts to happen, we may see more of those kinds of deals being made anyway to make it easier for people to use these services without that real consumer backlash. Because I think it is one of those things where we've been writing about this for years and I'm sure there will still be people who just go, oh, well, I thought I had free roaming when I went overseas and we'll still draw up huge bills from time to time. But I think there's more general awareness of it. So, Adam, as people who indirectly make our living out of advertising because it pays for a lot of journalism in a lot of different ways, ad blocking is one of those fairly controversial topics, and it's particularly controversial on the internet where there's always this fight between invasive ads and ad blockers and people making a living and that kind of thing. What's the latest story in all of this? What's the latest brouhaha? Well, the, there was a time when the ad blocking war was all on the desktop, but now that was they've kind of given up on that a little bit and the war is now seems to be more happening in the mobile space uh, uh apple made some changes mm. last year with safari but the latest thing that happened is that samsung changed its android browser to allow for third party plugins that could block ads so then because uh, uh, Samsung doesn't really make money out of ads. To that's speak the of. thing. And, because, and Samsung are good friends with Google who make you know the bulk of their money out of ads. So there was always going to be a bit of tension here. So what's happened is Samsung's changed little, their little browser. Little secret for the listeners, by the way, Google is an advertising company. This is how they make the money. Oh, yeah. I think they're a search company. They're not. They're an ad company. Yeah. Everything else is just fluff around the edges pretty much. Um, so, so Samsung's got their browser on Android and they've set it up so you can plug in uh, third-party plugins and so then plugins started turning up in the Google Play App Store and one of them was called Adblock Fast so you go to the App Store you install Adblock Fast to block the ads in the Samsung browser now Google decided they didn't like this and they pulled it from the the App Store now it's a bit weird because there's a couple of others still there and it hasn't quite been clarified what's going on but Google's argument seems to be that it's been pulled from the store because it interferes with other apps and services 
Now, you might say, yeah, but Samsung wants it to do that. But maybe their idea is, mm. yeah, but what happens if someone then tries to do it to a, a catch-up service that doesn't want it all? So it's kind of hard to know exactly what their motivation here. But the, if you boil it down, it seems to be, if I made money. an Android... Oh, yes, their money, motivation obviously. is yeah. money. But the rough line seems to be at the moment, if I make a browser and put ad blocking in it, that's okay. But if I'm a, a plugin designed for another browser, that's not okay for me to be in the Google Play Store, except for the ones that are still there that haven't been kicked out yet. Is, is that clear? <laughs> yeah, clear I mean, I mine? think... The, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes and no. Yeah. I think the interesting thing here, of course, is that Android being as open as it is, it's going to be very difficult for Google to have the kind of iron fist control that, for example, Apple does have on yeah. iOS apps. Samsung has its own app store, and presumably it could say, hey, ad, block, ad blocking apps, come play with us. Mm. And there's always the sideloading kind of stuff. But equally having said that, it's not an entirely surprising kind of development in that, in, in that mobile ad blocking is the current, you know, battlefront. Because it's always been that delicate balancing act between advertisers reasonably legitimately getting their products in front of people and helping to pay for services on the internet to be free as a result. But a lot of mobile ads are really, really, really terrible in that late 90s punch the monkey kind of way. But yes. if you punch a smartphone, it ends up very badly. But it's also the bandwidth. I mean, I originally started using uh, a desktop ad blocker 10 years ago, more. And the reason why is because when I was using my computer on a mobile brand service, mobile broadband service, the ads were costing me money. The ads, you know, the flash ads and stuff, hmm. I was paying to watch them. I thought, this is not cool. So I, that's when I first started to dabble in blocking ads. Now, these days, we've got much higher allowances on our phones, and you could argue that, a, you know, a meg here and a meg there is not such a difference. But there still is that principle of it's bad enough that I have to watch the ad, and you could claim that is my payment for this content that I looked at your ad, but to actually take money out of my pocket at the same time seems a bit rich. Yeah, I mean, I look, I, the, the amount of data they use does not annoy me anywhere as much as the invasive full-screen ads, the takeover ads, the ones that try and push you towards an app store to buy something, yeah. some of which may be entirely kind of malware-based and can be very iffy. That's the stuff that I really object to in a mobile advertising sense. Again, I'm, you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite about this stuff. A lot of what I do and have done in the past is paid for via the... Um, uh, via the inclusion of advertising. It's yeah. definitively a thing. And so I think there has, you know, there, there, there's, there's probably a reasonable ground, but I'm not sure that we're there as yet for um, for mobile ads. Whereas on the desktop, I think it has actually gotten a lot better. I have relatively few problems with most standard, you know, Google AdWords-esque style um, ads because they're small, they're inobtrusive they're not that kind of problem. But I think this just goes to a, a broader question of the, the issue with advertising as a concept um, is that as people start to not want to watch it, they respond by making it more intrusive, which drives more people away. Now, I didn't watch the X-Files on free-to-air television the other night. I think we've already covered that. But I heard from people that did is, you know, halfway through the X-Files and you know, a half the screen gets taken up with a, you know, warn his face for an ad for some show or some rubbish. Now, I'm, you're not going to get me to come back to free-to-air television by doing that. And I think it's the same with some of these ads as well. You say they become more intrusive because they want to be more effective, but they're just driving people away. It's kind of reaching the point where they need to rethink their entire strategy if they think that's absolutely, the way absolutely. It's, it's it's that balancing act, and right now the balance is way out of whack. Well, that just about wraps it up for this episode of Vertical Hold. Remember, if you've got any comments, hit us up in the comments section on YouTube, via Twitter, or the Facebook Vertical Hold page. Thanks for joining us, and remember, if you like what you hear, hit that subscribe button.